So what I'd like to do today is give you an introduction to thinking about prevention. And uh, in the context of working with children, and I'm going to talk today about a universal prevention program. So it's a program that's designed for all kids, not just specifically for kids and families who are uh, already evidencing problems. Um, so to get started, um, uh, I'm going to talk uh, in four different sessions. In the first session, I'll give you background about this program, where it came from, and uh, I'm going to go all the way back to the 60s and the 70s, because that's where this program began. I'll try to give you a little taste of, of where it started and uh, where we ended up. Uh, then we'll take a break. In the next session, we'll talk about the, the components of the program that are directed specifically at parents and caregivers. Then we'll take another break, have lunch, and then in the afternoon we're going to talk about the pr uh, part of the program that's directed at children uh, in the classroom, on the playground in schools. Take another break and then at the end we'll try to put it all together and I'll talk about uh, issues around using this program out in the real world, outside of the scientific uh, uh, community where it was developed and where you know everything can be controlled because we know it's not really that way in the real life. There's lots of uncontrolled variables. Uh, so that's, that's the plan for the day. Uh, so to start with background. So what I'd like to do to get started is uh, talk a little bit about this issue of what is an evidence-based program. So I'm sure all of you have an idea of what an evidence-based program is, and I'd like to find out what that idea is. So could you just take a moment and write down on this card, if you wouldn't mind, how would you define what an evidence-based program is? Uh, an evidence-based program provides uh, interventions based on multiple studies regarding uh, play therapy and parent-child therapy, uh, treatment that has been proven via randomized clinical trial or possible other studies that are deemed acceptable to be safe and effective with at least one instance of replication. A program that is research-based and has been generated to a specific population that it was studied. Based on feedback from actual trials, usage of strategies with families, implementation with a specific population, control group versus experimental group, reliability and validity, well-defined set of practices and interventions that's been shown to be effective. <coughs> Program which monitors long-term controlled trials, large population sample, use of interventions. Well, you guys know a lot about evidence-based practices. So the, 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 uh, the types of comments that you're making are somewhat unusual in a group this size that comes from a wide variety of backgrounds because it's much more, your, your points are much more science-based than you usually hear. So a lot of my work is out in the policy and practice community and, uh, and with legislators and state government in Washington State and Oregon State and there's generally a much broader view about evidence-based practices in those communities and what you all are, are talking about. So for some people, you know, the evidence that's required for something to be an evidence-based practice could be just something that was learned in clinical practice and it never was studied. It never was uh, subject to more intensive types of research designs. Uh, for other folks, uh, an evidence-based practice for a population uh, might just be something, a study that was done that happened to include people from a certain population, but there really wasn't anything done specifically to learn about that population. They were just part of the sample, you know. There's kind of a wide variety of views. So anyway, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about what I consider an evidence-based practice, and that's pretty close to the kind of things that some of you mentioned. So uh, the typical definition in the scientific community is a randomized controlled trial, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it means that you start with a defined sample from a population, so let's say you were interested in learning more about people in Miami and uh, you uh, were specifically interested in learning about, let's say, a specific subgroup of the population in Miami, like uh, you know, folks who came from a, another country that aren't immigrants, for example, in Miami, uh, you uh, would recruit uh, 
people from that uh, population to be in your study and ask them if they would be willing to be randomly assigned to flip a coin and either end up in one group or another. Uh, in one group, they might get an intervention like lift. In the other group, they might get an alternative intervention or sometimes no intervention, no systematic intervention. Uh, hopefully, your sample of people that you study is pretty large. And then uh, you uh, do this intervention, and you want the intervention to be of a certain quality, because one of the difficulties that we have out in the field is that there's not enough money or time to provide enough training and supervision for people to really do an intervention well. So there's a lot of drift, and people end up doing things that they're more familiar or comfortable with, or they come up with different ideas that may be perfectly fine, but they're really different than where you started. Uh, so there's some kind of implementation quality going on, control, supervision, training, ongoing training. Then hopefully in this study, the people that you recruited to be in the study stick around so you find out what happens to them because, of course, in the field, a big problem with interventions is you only find out what happens to the kids and families who stay in your program. And it may be a lot. Don't end up in your program at the end. You only find out what happens to the 30% that actually showed up to your parenting classes, but you don't know about the other 70%. Uh, in, a, in a good randomized trial, you hopefully have long-term follow-up, and then you do uh, analyze the data that you do have in an appropriate way. So that's kind of a typical scientific definition and applies to the study that I'm going to talk about today. But the evidence base that has been generated by these types of studies, these randomized controlled trials that are filling the evidence base around children and families, uh, generally have been conducted by people who come from a certain way that they think about the world. And those folks tend to really think more about people's behaviors and maybe their thoughts, but not so much about culture and context and other issues like that. So they tend to be cognitive behavioral type people. Uh, most of the interventions that end up on these best practices lists, evidence-based practices lists, usually are working with a child or a family, but not the larger community and they tend to be relatively brief interventions. Um, but I think the key thing to keep in mind today, and I hope today to kind of walk you through and give you an understanding of where this intervention came from, um, I think a key thing to, to keep in mind is that although there are a lot of evidence-based practices out there in the world, and there's a lot of best practices lists that have now been developed by federal government, state, government, private foundations, etc. the various labels and ratings that call a program good uh, are simply indicators this, that this program might be helpful, but it's not a guarantee. <coughs> so there's some evidence of promise that's been documented in a solid way, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to work with the specific client base that you work with, with the students that you work with. There is uncertainty of success, but at least the program is well documented. You know where it came from, and you know what it does with the group that, it, that it's been applied to. And if that seems useful for the people that you work with, great. It may or may not. So, so today we're going to talk about conduct disorder. What is conduct disorder? So the typical definition is that it's children who have conduct disorder are showing uh, serious levels of antisocial behavior in a persistent manner. So they may be involved in frequent aggression against others, may be involved in stealing, may be involved in a variety of lying and cheating and in a variety of other kinds of behaviors. And depending on what age of the child you're talking about, this constellation of symptoms looks different. And it's not that these behaviors aren't done by every child at one time or another, maybe in a minor way, but we're talking about kids who really are showing persistent and serious antisocial behavior. And the program I'm going to talk today was designed to try to address early signs, early indicators of a child on their way to showing these more serious levels of, kind of behaviors. Why is conduct disorder important? Because children who end up becoming seriously and persistently involved in displaying antisocial behaviors or at high risk for later substance use and abuse, being in violent and 
uh, unhappy relationships, uh, ending up incarcerated <coughs> and being disenfranchised from uh, society, unemployment, and then uh, passing on these problems to the next generation. So it's a very serious set of issues that we're talking about on the table <coughs> today. In fact, some people have estimated that in the United States alone, uh, <coughs> conduct disorder accounts for approximately $100 billion per year in spending. And this is due to uh, victimization, uh, effects on mental health, physical health, interaction with uh, hospital and, and uh, health care costs, property loss and damage, et cetera, et cetera, and in incarceration. And so, for example, in my state, and this has happened in most states across the country, uh, beginning in the 1970s, there were passage of uh, mandatory sentencing laws that have uh, uh, affected different communi uh, communities and drastically different ways. And in Oregon, due to these laws of locking people up early and uh, at lengthy periods of time, the prison population has increased dramatically. If those laws had not been passed, the prison population in Oregon would be about the same today as it would have been 20 years ago. Not the case. So this type of graph is pretty common in most states in the US right now. Today we're going to talk about uh, a prevention program, not an intervention program. So this is for children who may someday exhibit conduct disorder, but they may not. Um, Prevention intervention is a program that starts before children are showing signs of problem behaviors. But this is a universal prevention program that was developed for using in schools. So in schools, there are some kids that have more problems than others, and this program doesn't exclude those kids. And in fact, some of its biggest effects are on those kids, which is interesting. But it's, it's a program that's designed not to label anybody, not to pull anybody out. It's a universal program that applies to everybody. So, on to lift, linking the interests of families and teachers. So what I'm going to do now is take you back to where this program started with the hope that, uh, w with the intention of illustrating to you something important to keep in mind about evidence-based practices, that most of the foundations for most evidence-based practices that we have today for children and families started in the milieu that I'm going to illustrate to you now. It may feel somewhat foreign and different to you, but this is where it started, and it's good to know that. Most of the base for these programs came out of research that was done in the 60s and the 70s in the United States. Uh, this fellow here is one of my mentors, Jerry Patterson. He was the, the fellow that was behind a lot of the thinking here. This is him in 1955 with some of his kids. <laughs> And at that point in time, a he was a, a new uh, clinical psychologist. He'd fought in World War II. He came out of that. He went to school on the GI Bill. Um, he started uh, uh, learning about the types of uh, therapies that were popular at that time. There really wasn't much to do with kids at that point in time, but what was evolving slowly was, was working individually with children in a play therapy kind of setting. Parents were not on the scene yet. And typically in the, in the uh, center that he worked, uh, a uh, parent, a mother typically, would bring a child in, usually eight, nine years old. Uh, the kid was having trouble at home in school. Uh, the parent was kind of at their wit's end, and they didn't know what to do. So this was a, a pretty typical case. And uh, during the 50s, there was a variety of centers that Jerry worked in, but, but most of them applied kind of this quasi-pop psychology version of play therapy with kids. It wasn't very well developed from a psychoanalytic point of view even. It was child-focused, and the parent would bring their kid into the clinic, and then they'd leave. So it was very much disconnected from families. Uh, what Jerry learned early in his career is that with the kids that he was working with that really had more uh, persistent and serious problems when they were eight or nine years old, it, you know, you could be in the room with the child and <clears throat> play with them and talk to them and you might feel like you eventually would connect with the child, but um, it really didn't do anything in terms of changing their behavior in the school environment and in the home environment. It wasn't, it was not helping 
parents or the child with the problem that they were brought in with. And uh, they did a variety of very simple um, experimental studies where they looked at uh, the potential for parents to influence the kinds of child behaviors that, <coughs> that um, parents were concerned about. A big one is just obeying compliance. If I ask you to do something, I'd like you to finish it. Another one is not arguing, not getting stuck in arguing with each other. And they did a variety of very simple studies that showed that, you know, you can change those behaviors. You just have to do specific things, and it's not enough just to talk about it. You can tell somebody, don't argue, but it doesn't stop them from, not ar you know, from arguing. Uh, so there was a variety of case studies that were done. And so what I'd like to do now is show you a video that's very much, uh, for me, from the Pacific Northwest, this feels kind of like home. For you in Miami, probably not, but this will kind of show you what these folks were like and where their thinking came from. And what I'd like you to do as you watch this movie is try to see the common, the common themes here. And you know, look past the clothes and the music and the other things and just try to see the people that are in this, in this film. Okay, or up a little more? Or? All right. Up a little. All right. Can we get the light down in the very front here, maybe? Yeah, social learning approach is a very optimistic way for uh, parents to think about a problem that their child is having. The, the problems that are defined as uh, behaviors that they can change. Uh, it gives them a strategy for working with their children and themselves as well that they can apply in the future. They don't have to see a psychologist every time there's a minor problem in a family. And all families have problems as part of their normal uh, socialization process. Thank you. 
No, we're going to be moved to the gym. Can I have a No. I said we're going to be eating it together. No, I always heard boys are more active than girls, I just have to tell you something that we're going to be a boy. No. Why? Why? I mean, you guys are supposed to. No, you don't. I can't do it all. You see all the last time. Well, I don't mean anything about the fit. If I did have that. Well, she knows you would be down here the last time. That's the same thing. Isn't it? No. Everybody's different, Tim. I didn't realize how different he was from any other boy. Tim, look at this mess. You were supposed to be coming into the lab with the doctor. And uh, I described his actions, breaking things, not being able to sit down and do his homework, couldn't play correctly. <coughs> would interrupt all the time, throwing tantrums, not getting along well with his sister. And he said that was just being a boy. Just go bug cast or somebody else. Or a the baseball. That's not a good idea. There you go. Very good. Sounds like you need a new baseball. Yeah. How about you, I guess? I've never known him a boy. In my own experience, I've grown up with white him. Just, just the way he got along. With uh, other people, he had to get a whole thing all the time. It shows me that uh, someone that I have a spot at all the time is feeling insecure. And uh, he's that way around everybody. And I've seen him around other children, I'm sure, the same way. He's always, he always has to be that number one, or he wants nothing to do with it.
thought that we needed some help. I just got too far. He was caught shoplifting in a store. He claimed that he found a laying on the floor, which he thought made it all right for him to take. Of course, he realized after, the, after he was caught that he was in the wrong and he lied about his name and they had to call the police to find out who he was and all that sort of thing. Police brought him home and they said because of the face, they forget about it. And, and so we felt that if we didn't do something now, he was going to end up in, in prison when he was an adult. So I called, I didn't know who to call, so I called them several different places. And finally I got a lady who referred me to the Oregon Research Institute. Oh, thanks, Diane. And, and would you uh, tell Dr. Reed something today? One of our first concerns in working with the uh, family is to be sure that the family, uh, as they come in, fit the project. That is, we're, we're not skilled at treating all forms of deviant child behavior. We're specializing. Talked to you the other day on the telephone. I was very concerned about what was happening to Tim. And about the started as soon as possible. Uh, this morning, uh, all we're going to do is work you for about an hour. Uh, Dr. Reed, and there's Dr. Reed. The real function of the uh, interview with a child is twofold. We want to get systematically obtained picture of how he sees himself, how he sees his family, and how he sees his peer group. And at the end of treatment, and also during follow-up, we'll uh, reobtain that kind of business. So that's for research purposes. Now the second thing, and uh, more pointed towards the treatment process, is that we want the child to begin pinpointing in his own mind uh, what aspects of his family he wishes to change. I mean, uh, for example, is it his father spanking him, or is it the mother nagging him, or his sister teasing him? What is it that he wants to change? Tim, I'd like to <coughs> talk to you a little bit, and I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. Okay. Now, we're going to try to help your family to get along a little better. And what I'd like to know from you is if there's anything in the way your family uh, gets along that you'd like to see changed. Um, yeah, always. I love what he does mean. Mm -hmm. He's hard. And I mean, my daddy can't yell loud. It's a uh, way of uh, helping the child to concretize something that he might not previously have stated to himself. I mean, specifically, what is it about his family that uh, he wishes to change? It's also, a, a kind of implied contract between the child and the person talking to him in that session about what's going to happen in this treatment process. I am an important member of my family. No. I behave badly at home. Yeah. My family is disappointed in me. Yeah. I'd like to uh, start with your description of these problems again, and we'll try to be very specific. Because if this is not the right place for you, then I should find another clinic, and I will. Uh, we'll see that you get in immediately. But uh, let's start then by having you tell me about the stealing. I and mean, that's what we're specializing in here. I'd like to hear about the kind of things that Tim does. Well, I think the with um, stealing part was mainly from, from us. Just being able to sit down and talk to somebody about our problems and how they were listening to us and giving us uh, their opinions. It was very uplifting now having ORI saying this is the way to do it and this, is, this isn't going to hurt him, this is going to be good for him and he'll benefit from it. So it stopped uh, disagreements between Jack and I on what we were doing right and what we were doing wrong. Going on you know, within the home and its interactions with you and with other kids as well. Well, sometimes I feel like I'm being worse by Tim. Uh, the other day I had a couple of girls. Tim and uh, his family had been caught up in such a coercive uh, process for a long period of time where Tim had trained his 
sister uh, to fight with him. He had uh, trained his mother to get very upset and to yell at him and his father to yell at him. And they, on the other hand, had trained him to be a whiny, a thoroughly disruptive child in the household. So here you have a uh, people that are very miserable, and they're all using pain control techniques, very unhappy. Now the notion is that we can teach them very quickly to stop doing that by using social learning approaches. And also for Tim, hi. How was it? Hi. We we're just talking about you know what we're planning on doing. Tim, I, I mentioned that John talked to you about this too, but just to review this briefly, we're going to help uh, your folks change things about the family that are really painful to them, the things that are happening each day that make them very uncomfortable. And as we go along, we're going to be talking to you about what you want to change in the family as well. And we'll see what happens. No guarantees. You know, maybe uh, uh, you can change your family the way you want it, all of you. But that's what we sort of specialize in here, helping people change their own family. Well, that was a pretty good beginning. Uh, so why don't we stop here for today, and people will be calling you on the telephone tomorrow to get data from you. And Mr. Al of our staff will be in touch with you to come out to your home, I guess, next Thursday evening. They'll call you back. Okay, thank you for coming in. Bye. Both parents were very cooperative. Uh, even in our opening contacts, uh, they performed all of the tasks uh, beautifully. For example, they read the little program textbook for three days and were calling, uh, eager to get on with the next step. When we asked them to collect data, they, it was always available. Uh, these people were highly motivated to produce change. Both the mother and the father collect data each day for three or four days, and this is collected uh, on the telephone. And if they've been prompt in collecting the data, then uh, our therapist, such as Al Levine, would agree to come, say, tomorrow to the home and then begin with the next step in treatment. Okay, I've given you not mine. Uh, I've got as many, twice as many not mine as mine in one day. And that's going to be quite a problem if he, uh, if he keeps doing it like that. And uh, you must be getting pretty frustrated just collecting the data and not doing anything about it. So today we're going to start doing something about it. The parents are asked to contribute things to the treatment process and to perform very specific functions. For example, in using timeout. Uh, timeout is a very simple idea. That is, each time Tim does something noxious, uh, to a family member, he's placed in a non-reinforcing situation for three to five minutes. Or every time that he does mind in the place. Do you think you have an idea of how to use time out? I think so. Yeah, I think you probably do too. And what, what I'd like to do now is make sure that, that you do, because it's really important. And uh, there's a lot of ways that time out can go wrong and study is properly. Is to actually do something what we call a role play. And you may or may not have done something like this before, but what I'd like to do is have, I'll take Timmy's role. I'll play Timmy. And I'd like you to give me a request and I will find, and then see if you can get me to go into time out. Okay. So I'll be Timmy and you ask me to do something. And uh, I won't do it and then we'll see how you take it. Timmy, would you please go into your room and clean it up? I'm in the middle of doing something. Doing the role play, I realized what I was saying. Well, you know, I was thinking so hard what I did say, and then I realized maybe it wasn't quite the right thing to say. I could tell the time, but I didn't. It was very difficult for these parents to stop debating with Tim as they were trying to use time off. Uh, very difficult for many parents, by the way. They just happened to be an excellent example. Uh, Timmy, could you go into your room and clean it up? Not right now, I did. Jimmy, I want you to go in now and clean the room up for a second. But the role playing itself gave me the opportunity to see things from any point of view. It also gave us the opportunity to act out what uh, what we were doing right and what we were doing wrong. Jimmy, I told you to go into the timeout. If you continue, you're going to get another five minutes. Okay, okay. See how, how it cuts short the arguing if you give them that other timeout? The idea is to cut the arguing as, as soon as possible. And if you realize that, this wisest thing to do is to just 
keep his mouth closed and walk into China and serve a short time rather than build up a long time out. <laughs> Oh, 
I got five B, two A. You're very proud of it, and everybody here may be surprised, surprised completely. Um, I didn't expect it at all. I'm not sure that you did expect it. You ready to go fish them off? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not trying to get it, because I found a new way to do it on TV today. I don't know what we're blaming ourselves to do. See, that's the very usual. Here. Bring it down there and move to some there. And you make a flip there and you go around one. One characteristic that we find in almost all of these children is that the parents complain that when they ask the child to do something, that uh, he's almost certain uh, not to mind. Now, if the program goes into effect, As the level of pain drops, that is, that all of the people stop hurting each other so much, that their feelings change and their feelings are shifting on the medication. They feel that they genuinely love this child. Oh, yes, they really have. Do you want to be well, when we play cards, he'll finish the game out rather than quitting. People <clears throat> feel comfortable with themselves and more trusting. Uh, and you can see people smiling more often. Uh, they feel happier about the other person. They feel happier about themselves. You notice know, this is the only Yes, I am. For fishing, he has, a, he has much more patience now. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's catching more fish than I am. Wow. Absolutely. Good. When we see these kinds of positive interactions increasing, then we'll start to talk to the family about terminating. The team at ORI will sit down and go over all of the data to reevaluate you know, what was involved in this family. Did we meet the goals that the parents uh, set for us and for themselves or not? One sixth of the uh, gaming behavior you were showing in baseline. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. And they were reporting on the phone that they're. Uh... Our observation code system tracks uh, 14 different noxious things that the aggressive children tend to do with their and in interacting with their family members and we call this uh, the total deviant behavior score. And uh, we have a teacher rating him every day and he's leveling out right at a good day, just about every day, doesn't make one slip up every two weeks. But, so that's looking really good. Oh, getting telephone calls from the principal and mm -hmm. Now it's one thing that Tim was concerned about in the beginning too. Yeah, he seems to be getting along better with the uh, kids at school also. Mm -hmm. He's having bringing friends home from school when parents feel good about going out. Uh, given that the family feels good uh, about the program and they uh, feel that they can terminate, then we'll try it out. Uh, the family goes into a follow-up phase, uh, which lasts for 12 months. The data for the whole project shows... Uh, I think by and large, we're finding that we can help about <coughs> four to out of three of these very difficult families that we worked with in the past eight years. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's really very sure. <coughs> when the uh, family has terminated, we particularly stress the importance of getting out and doing things again. <laughs> They were in this music institute, told us we should go out more often, and they were encouraging us to get away, and they thought it would help us and the children. Supposed to be a friendly place. It looks like it. I'm glad I don't have a heating. What a fantastic view we get from the balcony. I didn't say it. The place right down there looks like it'd be a good place to camp. And have our uh, bonfires? Don and I are able to get away a little bit and not have to worry about Timmy getting into things or causing difficulties for other people and without having to have somebody watch him. Okay. So it made a nice burn after all. It's nice to see the fire. Very nice. The best thing of all is we don't have to eat so long as we can. <laughs> Maybe that's what they're going to get now. It's amazing uh, as to how many of these uh, couples have uh, just forgotten to get off by themselves and to relate to each other as grown-ups. We uh, suggested to Tim's parents that they start doing this kind of thing. It's a pleasure because they obviously enjoyed each other so much. Anyway, 
going to do Sunday afternoon on a fish. I'll go with you on Monday. Sounds like a waste of time. <laughs> Oh, One of the difficulties in being a course of child is that uh, it turns off the peer group. In uh, Tim's case, he uh, began to stay at their homes overnight and inviting them to stay at his place, and they were going on trips together. This is a whole new world for Tim, and of course it's a delightful world, and one that he's not really participated in much before. said that seemed common. It could be today and not 30 years ago. <laughs> yes? The parents wanted to help but didn't know how to help. The parents wanted to help and didn't know how to help. <coughs> Other thoughts? We're facing the same problems our parents faced today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this was a time when Oregon was kind of at its peak and it wasn't long after this when uh, uh, the country went into recession, and Oregon's uh, economic base was timber. People weren't building as many houses. A lot of people 
had a lot of trouble in my town after about five, ten years after this movie was made, and it was a very different place. So this was kind of a peak economic time, and then there was a crash. And I, I'm sorry? About 1972. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other thoughts? This, the, I think the interesting thing about this historically is just a few years before this film was made, again, the focus was on kids alone. It wasn't talking to parents. And the kind of the uh, notion here that really got some traction was, you know, lives are complicated and there's lots of problems going on. And when you try to get a handle, where do you start? I mean, you know, where do you start when you have a problem? And, and the, the insight here was, well, one place to start is just in the daily interaction that a child has with their kids, a child has with their parents. That's a place to start. And if you can get some traction there, then the next place to go is, what about the interaction that that child has with their teacher? You know, and, and they really tried to simplify the world and get out of people's heads and into what they were doing. And, it, and as, as Jerry said in this film, uh, the thing that gave them encouragement is that by spending less time talking about the problems and talking about your feelings and just focusing on trying to change a few behaviors, people's feelings and their thoughts changed because things were better. Things were better in this family than they were before. And that was a place to start. It doesn't mean that that solved the problems, but it was a place to get a handle and get moving. You have a comment? At the beginning, the father referenced something about them being on medications. Did that, was that a part of the treatment or this is part of the treatment? Did it continue with the treatment? How was that? That wasn't part of the treatment that these guys developed, but uh, I would assume that there probably was a referral at some point out to a, a physician and that, that medication was used. But the treatment these guys were developing wasn't dependent on that. And most cases weren't like that. But this case was, I think, a nice illustration because this was kind of a typical kid that would come in the clinic. And many of them did have more attention problems and hyper hyperactive problems, but these guys didn't focus on that. It just happened to be one of the, one of the issues that was going on.